Welcome, welcome everyone out there in virtual TV land to the first ever Fairfax County Juneteenth Resiliency Awards program. My name is Tilly Blanding and I am a member of the Fairfax County Black History Planning Committee and I will be your MC for today. Let me tell you a little bit about Juneteenth to start off with. Juneteenth, also known as Freedom Day or Emancipation Day, is the oldest known celebration commemorating the end of slavery in the United States. President Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation went into effect January 1st, 1863. It wasn't until June 19th, 1865, when the Union Army brought word of the proclamation to enslaved people in Galveston, Texas, making them among the last to be freed. Juneteenth has become not only a time to commemorate black liberation from the institution of slavery, but also a time to highlight the resilience, solidarity, and culture of the black community. Now we will hear words of reflection from Chairman Jeffrey McKay and County Executive Brian Hill on the importance of Juneteenth to our county and our nation. Fairfax County residents, I'm honored to share a few words on this very important date. First, I want to congratulate the winners of our 2021 Juneteenth Resiliency Award. It's not easy being young, but know how proud I am of you, and we all know our future is bright when we listen to our young people. These 10 young men and women, however, overcame the obstacles, the resistance, and accomplish what they set out to accomplish. They have shown strength and are truly reflective of what's so amazing about our Fairfax County community. I wanna thank each and every one of you for all you have done. On Juneteenth, we come together to celebrate long overdue emancipation and freedom and to reflect on our imperfect history. I'm proud that last year, I could declare Juneteenth a county holiday for the first time so all of our residents can reflect on this important day. In Fairfax County, just as all over the country and the South, we sit on land owned by a slave owner and we must never forget that our history was built on the trauma of black people. I don't have to remind you that the impacts of slavery, racism, and discrimination are still very evident today. We must and can always do better. In Fairfax County, we work hard every day to begin to right the wrongs of our history and to lift up our communities. That's why we passed our One Fairfax policy that put equity at the center of every decision we make. Soon, we will be receiving an update from county staff on the recommendations presented by my chairman's task force on equity and opportunity. Their recommendations look deep into structures of our county government that stand in the way of equity and progress in Fairfax County. I know we are on the right path to move forward, but we still have much work to do together. Thank you to our community for always looking towards progress and always pushing us to advance. Hello, I'm pleased to be joining you today as we recognize Juneteenth, a day to celebrate freedom and resiliency in Fairfax County and across the country. The Fairfax community is very proud to have so many young people who have achieved so many accomplishments despite the challenges they face today. This year we celebrate 10 of those young people for their accomplishments in faith, fashion design, sports, language arts, commitment to the community, advocacy for change centralizing around disabilities and name changes of schools, literary skills, mentorship, life challenges, and above all, academics. I salute you, Eric, Adiana, Samara, Tiffany, Nasa, Derman, Kimberly, Yasmin, Katrina, and Donnie. Congratulations, you are this year's Juneteenth Resiliency Award winners. 
you have worked hard to make meaningful strides in your lives and in the lives of others in our community. I salute these young people. Your future is bright. I am so honored to say well done, and I look forward to your continued success as you proceed into the next chapter. In recognizing you, we also celebrate Juneteenth with hope and promise for a better future. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Chairman McKay and County Executive Hill for those uplifting, inspiring words. Next, we have special guest, Lee District Supervisor Rodney Lusk. Supervisor Rodney Lusk is a native Virginian, a graduate of the University of Virginia, mm -hmm. and has served his community as a Fairfax County employee for the past 31 years. From delivering human services along the historic Richmond Highway Corridor, serving on the staff of two different members of the Board of Supervisors, Jerry Conley and Kate Hanley, to his former role as National Marketing Director at the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority. Supervisor Rodney Lusk is a native Virginian. He is a graduate of T.C. Williams High School and the University of Virginia. Over the course of his career, he has worked in human services, economic development, and now serves on the Board of Supervisors. Thank you for joining us today, Supervisor Lusk, to share your story of resiliency. Thank you, So Tilly. glad to have you here. You know, a lot of people know you as uh, on the Board of Supervisors, right. but we want to know something more personable about you. Sure. Okay? Yes, ma'am. So I know you're ready to share with us. I am. Tell us a little bit about your childhood. What was yeah. it like growing up and being Rodney Lusk? Yeah, let, let, let me fast forward to my 11th birthday. So something happened in my life at that time. My parents got divorced. And when people hear divorce, they normally think, oh, this is terrible. This is just the worst thing that could happen to you. But in my case, it was the best thing that could happen to me. I got the opportunity to go live with my grandparents, my brother, my mother, and I, and I'll say it was a changing point because my grandparents were just so focused on making sure we understood the values such as honoring our commitments, mm -hmm. such as being of service to others. If you mm -hmm. saw someone in need, you had a responsibility to help those folks. And to think about your community, what is your role in making your community better. I watched my grandparents exhibit these values. They showed me on a daily basis how they lived their lives, how they helped others, and I'm going to say without them, I would not be the person that you see here today. And as a result of their efforts, it is my personal quest to honor their legacy uh -huh. by being the best person that I can be and making sure that I make a difference here in this community. And that's why I chose to run and become a member of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. So basically what I heard from that is that you felt not happy, probably sad that your parents were divorced, but it was a blessing that you had your grandmother there too, to I encourage did. you um, to did. do some of the things you did. Thank yes. you. You are the first African American man to serve on the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. Tell us about your experience being the first one in your family to go to college. Yeah. What um, was that like? Uh, well, I'll say this. It was very difficult and probably one of the hardest things I've ever done. But I'll say again, there's a role that my grandmother played here. When I was in fifth grade, she had a series of placemats that she had placed along our dining room table. There was one that was a lighthouse in Virginia. There was one that was a state capital in Virginia. And the one that caught my attention the most was a depiction of the University of Virginia. There was the rotunda in the center, the lawn on the west, and the lawn on the east sides. And I remember looking at this picture and telling my grandmother, that's a beautiful place. And her response back to me was, you can go there. And I, I got to say this, it was very empowering. And my response back to my grandmother is, I'm going to go to the University of Virginia. So again, I'm in fifth grade. I go to my teacher the next day, and I tell her, my grandmother and I decided last night that I'm going to the University of Virginia. And I'll be honest, she kind of got a little, 
whitish in her complexion, <laughs> and she said, I need to talk to you after class. I met with her after class, and she gave me the roadmap and the blueprint for what I needed to do. She said, Rodney, you're going to have to get mostly A's and some B's. I'll give you a couple B's. You're going to have to think about what's going to differentiate you from the other folks who are going to apply to University of Virginia. What's going to make you attractive to university? Think about sports, but I've seen you. I don't know if sports is going to be the thing for you. <laughs> um, she mentioned different activities. So mm -hmm. she talked about student council. She talked about different groups. And I cataloged every single thing she said. And for the next about three years, I'd go back to her and give her a progress report on how I was doing both academically and how I was doing in these other activities. And by the time I got to the 11th grade, this is when you go talk to your counselor. So I go meet with my counselor. And I said to her, um, I want to go only to one school. And she got really upset and said, well, that's not how we do this. You've got to pick a number of schools. Right. I said, well, the only school I want to go to is the University of Virginia. And she says, okay. She looked at my grades, looked at my SAT scores, and she was like, okay, it looks like you can possibly get in, but I got to tell you, uh, we don't recommend this, and you need to pick some other schools. So we talked. I came up with three other schools. I made the application to four in total. Um, being the university, the only one I really wanted to go to. I waited anxiously in April when those letters came back. And I'll say, when I got the letter from UVA, it was scary to open, um, but I did it with my, uh, with my grandmother, and I was um, accepted. And it was one of the most amazing wow. days of my life. Yeah. So what my mother and I did was we went down to UVA because they had something they called Spring Fling. Mm -hmm. So you get to kind of tour the university, you get to meet with other students, and get a sense of what it would be like to be a student there. So we had um, a young lady by the name of Lawana Dean. I remember this as if it were like yesterday. She was my tour guide. She was an AKA, absolutely stunning. Good woman. Mm -hmm. Beautiful woman. And she takes us up along the east lawn, across the rotunda, and down to the west lawn. She stops at room 55. Mm -hmm. She knocks on the door. Out comes Rodney Akers. So Rodney is African American. He kind of about my height, my weight, and my mother, who's standing right beside me, after Rodney says, I've had four great years at the university. I'm student council vice president. I live on the lawn, and this is an honor. Any of you could also do this. My mother, standing right beside me, goes, you can do this. And I was like, this guy like walks on water. He's like special. He's superhuman. Right. So my stomach, there's like a pit. It dropped. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I, ca I can't do this. Mm -hmm. Four years later, wow. and it wasn't even like I calculated. It wasn't like I got into the university, and I'm like, I'm going to be the next Rodney Akers. Right. I ended up being student council vice president and through some serious hard work. I ended up being a resident of the lawn, and you have an application for that, and you have a little hat that they put a number, and the room number is in the hat. So I reached in, I grabbed my number, and I pulled it out, room 50. Five. Whoa. So I ended up living in Rodney Aker's room, and I ended up having people knock on my door, and I would tell my story. And I just want those that are listening and those that are here to know that, you know, you might have difficult times, and you might go through difficult circumstances, and believe in yourself. You can succeed. You can go as far as you believe and further if you push yourself. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Well, you know, thank you for sharing that. You know, it, that's going to really be meaningful to someone out there who's listening. And it really highlights the importance of a teacher in a child's life. Because it sounds like your fifth grade teacher she was. was the person who mentored you, Yes. who encouraged you. Yes. We all need encouragers in our life. We do. She was. And then mm -hmm. when you went on to UVA, it was right. your Rodney Ayers, yep. right? Rodney Akers. Or Akers, mm -hmm. excuse me. No yes. Problem. Who uh, encouraged you. And he you did. followed in his footsteps. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> well, thank you. Okay, our next question. Tell us about a time when you took a stand yes. in a difficult, challenging situation. Yes. Think about that. So while I was at the University of Virginia, um, it became very apparent that the 
investments that the university was making in its endowment. Mm -hmm. So we had several hundred million dollars that were being invested in all these different companies and different products. The thing that the university was doing, which was disturbing, was investing money in companies in South Africa. Right. So for those who might know, apartheid was blaring and going in full steam uh, in the 80s. At the point that I got to the University of Virginia was 1984. I got very active on this issue in 1986. And we did something kind of controversial. So there's a member of the Board of Supervisors. His name is Walter Alcorn. He and I were serving on student council together, mm -hmm. and we were at the university together, and we decided to lead a protest to get students to ask the Board of Visitors, which is the governing body of the university, to divest the funds that were in South African companies. Right. We tried to do this with a letter, and we requested the president take it forward, and we were kind of pushed aside. So we led a second protest, and in this protest, we put up what we call shanties, which are basically cardboard um, tents on the lawn, which oh. is the main area, like the quad. So if you think about any other university, this is where everybody comes to the university. We scattered it with cardboard tents, which we slept in to request the university divest those funds. Oh. It took um, about a week and the university came back and was threatening basically to physically remove us. Some of us, we would be arrested if we didn't kind of comply, right. meaning take your little cardboard right. and get it off the lawn and let's end this protest. Yeah. Uh, we continued the protest and the university made the decision, with the president, to reach out and ask the Board of Visitors to consider divesting the money from the South African wow. companies. Wow. It took about a year, but it happened. The University of Virginia adopted the Sullivan Principles, which is basically to remove, comp re remove funding from companies investing in these types of um, apartheid-related businesses. It was, a, um, it was a beautiful thing. Well, it had to be a scary time, uh, because that took a lot of courage for you to do that. May I ask, um, yes. were those students all African-American, or no. were they... No. Caucasian, white, okay. There were a mixture of students, both mm -hmm. African American, Asian, mm -hmm. other minorities, and white. Right. Walter Alcorn, as you might know, represents the Hunter Mill District. Walter is white. Mm -hmm. um, he is my best friend in this world. He is an amazing soul, and I've known him since I was 19. He is um, diligent in ways I can't begin to express. And it's been just my delight to be able to be his friend and to work with him now on the Board of Supervisors. We thank you for that, you know, because you were on the battlefield for justice mm -hmm. and you live your life like that now. So we thank you for that. Sweet. Courage. Thank you. What words then of encouragement do you have to impart for our winners in those in our community? The winners. Yes. of this Resiliency Award, because you showed resilience, see, yes. when you did that, and courage. So yes. talk to our children about that. Yes, ma'am. I'll say this. Um, don't be afraid of taking risks. And I think each of us has you know, a tolerance that we believe is our tolerance, but we can go much further. And I'm going to give you two examples. Um, in 1995, then Supervisor Jerry Conley asked me to come and meet with him mm -hmm. to talk about the work I'd been doing in human services. For 45 minutes, I told him what we'd been doing, and he goes, you're hired at the end of it. And I said, hired to do what? Because I didn't even know I was in an interview. <laughs> I'm like, hired to do what? And he goes, hired to be my land use and zoning aid. And I looked at him and said, um, I know nothing about land use and zoning. And he basically said, I have it on good authority that you're the right person for this job. Mm -hmm. And it was the smartest thing I did to accept that job because I learned about development. I learned about working in Tyson's. I learned about working in Merrifield. Um, then Supervisor Conley and I got to work on the redevelopment mm -hmm. of the Mosaic project. 
he came to me one day and he said, Rodney, I'm tired of looking at those U-Haul rental establishments. I'm tired of looking at that movie theater. And I don't know what that building that has all those gargoyles on it, but <laughs> you need to help me get that cleaned up. Uh -oh. And I said, Supervisor, I'll get to working on that. Okay. So we put together a charrette, and in that charrette, we talked about a mixed-use development. And that mixed-use development would have office, residential, and retail in that spot of that mixture and hodgepodge of things. So on the day that the mosaic project opened, it was fortuitous that Jerry and I walked up together. We didn't come together, mm. but I happened to be walking up at the exact same time he was. We got to the door together to walk into the Angelica Theater, and he said to me, what do you think about this project? Is it what you expected? And I said, Jerry, it is far better than I ever would have imagined. Wow. And he looked at me and said, you had a hand in this. Oh. And we went into the project and got to see the first movie at the Mosaic, oh, and we it. got to see what has now become one of the most impressive yeah. mixed-use uh, developments here in Fairfax County. Wow. And what then, a story. Go ahead. And then the last point I'll make is, I mentioned this to you earlier, Tilly. Mm -hmm. This is a surprise. Mm -hmm. So those who might not be aware, I climbed a little mountain, which is the tallest freestanding mountain in the world, Mount Kilimanjaro. This was 15 years ago. Whoa. I'm also afraid of heights. Now, this is a crazy thing. So whenever I get into a roller coaster, it's really high, I want to get off. Whenever I go up to a lighthouse, and I love lighthouses, uh -huh. I got to get down. I get up there, I see it, I'm like, I got to get down. So I'm like, I got to conquer this fear. And one of the best ways to do that is to conquer something that is the tallest thing on the planet. Wow. So two of my best friends from college and I went up to Mount Kilimanjaro. We had 12 people in our group as we ascended, something happens to your body. Your body starts rebelling on you. You have less oxygen, your head hurts, your body hurts, it's cold, it's windy. Your body's like, get me the freak off this mountain. <laughs> and I'm gonna say something, which I was tempted, I'm gonna be honest. Mm -hmm. I got to a place where this is hard. Mm -hmm. This is really hard, I'm not sure I can finish this. I heard my grandfather's voice. Whoa in my head, and my grandfather said, never, ever quit. Right. So what I did is I said, okay, I'm gonna take it one step at a time. I got step one, then I got step two, I got step three, step four. I was at the top of Mount Kilimanjaro, Whoa. and you'll see a picture of that. Um, I will say that it was magnificent in terms of the view. And I'll close by saying, I looked out over the horizon. So the beauty of climbing Mount Kilimanjaro at midnight mm -hmm. is you arrive at the summit at the point that the sun is coming up. Wow. So as the sun is coming up and it's below you, you're looking down the sun, you're looking down the clouds, hmm. you can see the curvature of the earth. Wow. I will never forget that, but I will say after 15 minutes, I got to get off this mountain. I was leading my guide. I was leading the team that was left with me off that mountain. But you conquered your fear. Yes, ma'am, I did. You faced it. That took courage. And for people who may think that you've lived a charmed life, you've really shared no. with us today no. that that is not so. No. And you've said to those children yes. and people listening, yes. if you believe, yes. if you only believe, yes. And if you have someone in your life to encourage and uplift you, mm -hmm. uh, we thank you for sharing today. Thank you, Supervisor Lusk, for sharing your story with us. We hope that it mm -hmm. encourages others to achieve their goals, mm -hmm. to never quit, right. to remember something that mm -hmm. a family member or a teacher right. has said to them that is encouragement. So we thank you for that so much. Yes, ma'am. We learned a lot about you today. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, up next, we will begin the awards portion of our program. Greetings, everyone. My name is Solomon Melson. On this historic day, we come together and recognize and celebrate the resiliency and perseverance of some of our young people have displayed while continuing to stay positive, 
steadfast as they continue on the journey to greatness. Today, the Fairfax County Black History Committee would like to recognize several recipients of the inaugural Juneteenth Resiliency Award of 2021. These recipients have demonstrated the ability to withstand hardship and recover from difficult life events and continue to overcome adversity in amazing ways. Mm -hmm. This award recognizes and celebrates resiliency in youth and young adults ages 13 to 21 who have exhibited true perseverance, also known as grit, determination, dedication, and persistence all to strive towards meaningful contributions and outcomes in their lives and or the lives of the black community. We all know it takes a village. And today we affirm that we are a part of your village. We honor you, we support you, we encourage you. So please keep on keeping on, continue believing in yourself. As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stated, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. Supervisor Lusk and I will now announce the winners of the Juneteenth Resiliency Award. Each winner will receive a personalized award. Supervisor Lusk will now announce the first winner. We are pleased to present the Juneteenth Resiliency Award to Eric Thurman. Eric has dealt with many challenges, but he has not complained about the things he did not have or has lost. He has positively persevered through all of life's struggles. When Eric was a junior in high school, he decided to get baptized and was confirmed as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. When many of his friends and family tried to persuade him to make a different choice, Eric showed resiliency by standing firm in his faith because he had a love of serving people and recognized that his life was on a different path that can help him grow physically, spiritually, socially, and intellectually. Eric decided to devote two years away from his friends and family to serve as a full-time church missionary. And he demonstrates every day that no matter what life hands you, you can choose a different path. Eric is 20 years old and was nominated by Brennan Hanfield. Congratulations, Eric. Well done. Thank you so much. It's such a privilege to be here celebrating this historic day with all of you. I'd like to offer my sincere thanks to um, those who give me this award and to all those who've helped me be resilient, including my church leaders and extended church community, my government and history teacher, Angie Hunter, my friends, my Savior Jesus Christ, and my family. Thank you again. We are pleased to present the next Juneteenth Resiliency Award winner to Adiana Khalid. Despite the challenges she faced growing up, Adiana is a young woman with one goal on her mind, pursuing a career in fashion designing. Next year, she will be a senior at Fairfax High School, and because of her hard work and dedication, she obtained an early admission to a fashion institute. Not only does Adiana excel in academics, she also is involved in supporting her community. Adiana demonstrated initiative and leadership skills through her involvement as a teen dating violence ambassador, advocating and educating other teenagers about healthy relationships. She has also helped develop the Mott Community Center Teens Council to advocate for issues that teens in her community are experiencing and to find or propose solutions to those issues. Adiana is a 17-year-old nominated by Sandra Chavez. Congratulations, Adiana. Thank you so much. You know what to say, but thank you. We are pleased to present the Juneteenth Resiliency Award to Samara Alexandra. Samara has gone above and beyond managing her high school, volleyball, and dance team. Even with that full schedule, Samara is committed to playing volleyball and has an amazing attitude the whole time she is playing. She has demonstrated leadership and her positive mindset influences her teammates to listen to instruction and guidance. Samara's presence is so uplifting. She is so eager to learn that it has become contagious and everyone around her wants to play hard and learn. Her ability to not only maintain a hectic schedule but also keep a good GPA shows commitment and dedication. 
Samar is a 15-year-old and was nominated by Justin Grazani. Congratulations, Samara. She could not join us tonight, but we wish her all the best. We are pleased to present the next Juneteenth Resiliency Award winner to Tiffany Stowers. In early March, when Fairfax County had to quarantine, Tiffany was sent home from high school without a chance to say goodbye to her friends, and her high school chose not to have a graduation ceremony. When Tiffany went to college, all her classes were online and no social interactions were allowed. Despite these challenges, she excelled in her classes. She worked hard and earned an academic award for Greek language arts excellence. Tiffany's friends respond to her positive attitude. They call her when they are down or want to laugh. Tiffany convinced her friends to get vaccinated. Tiffany reminds us and others that good things are coming and to never give up. Tiffany is a 19-year-old and was nominated by Marta Stowers. Congratulations, Tiffany. Tiffany could not join us tonight, and we wish her all the best. We are pleased to present the Juneteenth Resiliency Award to Nasser Piper Fisher. As the world dealt with a global pandemic, the United States was also in a spiral of civil unrest, social injustices, and racial inequalities. Nasha took it upon herself to become part of the solution and became an advocate for the LGBTQ community by joining an advocacy group. Nasha also wrote an article that was published in Watchdog on November 2nd, 2020, titled Black Lives Matter, The Peace Within Protest. In this article, Nasha reflected on the many BLM protests that were taking place in the DMV and Fairfax. Nasha continues to be part of the various initiatives in the community, and she even interviewed Carla Bruce, Fairfax County's Chief Equity Officer, about one Fairfax and the disparities amongst communities of color. Nasha is a 15-year-old who was nominated by Leon Minkins. Congratulations, Nasha. Um, I just want to say thank you so much. I am so honored to have received this award and I really just want to say thank you to all my support systems from my mom to my teachers, my friends, my family, and my mentors at the Mott Community Center. Thank you so much. We are pleased to present the Juneteenth Resiliency Award to Derman Whitney. Navigating a global pandemic and racial unrest as a young black man can present its own set of challenges. For Derman, this difficult time of uncertainty did not waver his tenacious spirit. In addition to his schoolwork, he consistently sought out work in his neighborhood to help support his family. His perseverance led to a variety of contact-free outdoor weekend jobs, some of which involved hard manual labor. Derman's willingness to seek work in a predominantly white neighborhood after George Floyd's murder took a tremendous amount of courage. His displays of tenacity, perseverance, and courage has inspired others to work harder and approach situations with bravery. Derman is an 18-year-old and was nominated by Rebecca Gray. Congratulations, Derman. Um, I would just like to say thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. And I would like to give thanks to my uncle, my mother, and my two cousins, and specifically my aunt as well, for driving me to all those jobs and making sure I got there safe and sound. Thank you so much. We are pleased to present the Juneteenth Resiliency Award to Kimberly Botang. Kimberly was an influential voice and component in changing the name of Robert Lee High School to John R. Lewis High School. She galvanized a group of students to advocate for the name change through written word and increased student representation at school board meetings, protests, and various other formats where student voices could be heard. Kimberly did not back down when the negative comments and responses to her advocacy were made, and it only fueled her to keep fighting for what she knew to be right. Due to Kimberly's advocacy, she inspired other students to have a voice and to stand up for injustices that they continue to see in the schools and in the community. Kimberly is a 19-year-old and was nominated by Bonetta Caldwell. Congratulations, Kimberly. She could not be with us tonight and we wish her the best. 
We are pleased to present this Juneteenth Resiliency Award to Yasmeen Bolden. Yasmeen's experiences of being in spaces that excluded BIPOC representation, pedagogy, and being invisibly disabled inspired her to establish the Amplify Black Voices Project, a fundraiser that raised hundreds of dollars for Being the Bridge, an organization dedicated to educating the next generation of anti-racist and youth dedicated to racial reconciliation. This project gave black youth, many of whom had never been published before, the opportunity to have their work celebrated in an online art show. Yasmin also created Hypersensitivity, an online advocacy and education hub for BIPOC with auto-related disabilities. Hypersensitivity teaches many young people about racial disparities with the disability community and has helped pass national legislation that will protect them and other disabled people. Yasmin is 18 years old and is self-nominated. Congratulations, Yasmin. Thank you so much. I would like to thank everyone here present today. I'm so honored to be a part of this celebration. And I would like to thank my Be The Bridge community. I would like to thank my family and I would like to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are pleased to present the Juneteenth Resiliency Award to Katrina Tillery. Katrina may be young, but she has lived a life far beyond her years. She entered the foster care system at a young age. And while most people would have had a hard time adjusting and staying on task, Katrina has maintained employment and attended school while dealing with unstable and new housing. Katrina's ability to pursue her goals while dealing with life's challenges teaches everyone that no matter what life throws at you, you will succeed if you are focused and determined to succeed. Katrina is a 20-year-old and was nominated by Jernita Smith. Congratulations, Katrina. Thank you. We are pleased to present the Juneteenth Resiliency Award to Donnie Perry. For four years, Donnie has been a participant in the Fairfax Families for Kids mentoring program, a program that caters to youth in foster and kinship care. He has faced many struggles in his teen life. However, despite everything he has been through, Donnie manages to stay on task with school, maintain employment, and participate on high school football team and with the mentoring program, all while exhibiting a positive attitude. Donnie teaches those around him to be positive and stay the course. Donnie is an 18-year-old and was nominated by Ms. Jernita Smith. Congratulations, Donnie. He was unable to join us tonight and we wish him all the best. Congratulations. And please, congratulations to all of our winners. And now, let's turn it back to Miss Tilly to wrap up the show. Congratulations to all. Oh, thank you, Solomon and Supervisor Lusk, for presenting those awards of resiliency to our exceptional young people. Thank you also to Supervisor Lusk for sharing your personal story. Congratulations to all of our winners. We want to thank all of those who helped to make this event possible. The members of the Black History Planning Committee are Emma Marshall, Dale Wallace, Don Hyman, Paul Woods, Renee Edwards, Ramona Carroll, Solomon Melson, and Tilly Blandy, and the Juneteenth Award Committee members, Ajaysha Thomas, Andrea Richardson, Benny Heron, Keisha Koch, Latanya Lattimore, Tina Morans. We leave you with the inspiring words from the song, If You Believe, by Broadway actor, writer, producer, activist, and my niece, Amber Iman, of Hamilton fame. <laughs> See you next year, everybody. <laughs>
Because the time will come around when you say it's yours. Believe there's a reason to be. Believe you can make time stay still. You know. Believe in yourself right from the start. You'll have brains, you'll have a heart, you'll have courage to last your whole life through. So